Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Stars Like Us. I'm your host, Eliza Kelly, and today I am here with someone who's recently become, I would say, a, a lovely new friend. Um, this is Bree Hall. I was recently on Bree's upcoming podcast, which is incredible. We're going to be talking about it on this show as well. But for those who are not familiar with this incredible Gemini Sun, Scorpio Moon, Sagittarius Rising, Bree Hall, aka Lahara, is a multi talented singer, songwriter, YouTuber, and lifestyle blogger. She originally started her YouTube presence under the name, how, well, how do you say this? Martista Beauty. Martista Beauty in 2014, also known as That Bitch, when it comes to the essentials of fashion, hair care, and beauty. Since the early days, she has evolved into a creative guru, putting out R&B singles that capture her soulful presence and dishing out fabulous advice for self-care and inner beauty. The following on her channel has grown to over 700,000, which is just a really big number with millions of views to witness her wisdom and glow. Wisdom and glow is 100% correct. And we were also just teeing before this about yes. how incredible all of these names are for capturing the true essence of Gemini. Having so many different AKAs is like the most Gemini thing imaginable. <laughs> Bree, yes. thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I could not be more excited for this episode, especially the way we left off on my podcast. Like I was just like, just itching to talk to you again about everything we were just leading up to. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. So I, a spoiler for those who are going to soon be listening to Bree's podcast is um, Bree challenged me to guess her sign, to guess her big three. And it's a challenge that I sometimes decline because sometimes I'm like, I'm just not feeling it. I'm not, I don't know. It's a little all over the place, but when Brie asks you a question, you, you accept the challenge. That is what I learned. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out we got it, nailed it. Yes. Um, when I say there was like a renowned silence between <laughs> everyone, between production, between like all of us, we were just like, wait, she got it. She got it. <laughs> <laughs> it happened. But yes. I would say that the thing that really, I, I, well, we're going to talk about your Scorpio moon a little bit later on. I would like for us to kick this episode off, especially because this is Gemini season. Um, yes, it was it just is. your birthday. Happy belated birthday. Thank I would, you. I would love for us to talk about Gemini slander and to talk about <sighs> Gemini hate. It's, it's the hate is real. It's a lifestyle, honestly. Like I just, I'm walking through the valleys of the shadow of death at all times. No, I'm just kidding. But literally it's funny when people bring up signs, I always get kind of nervous because I'm like, oh, here we go. I'm just waiting on it. You know how like, like when some people wait on attendance for the teacher to just mispronounce their name. Oh, I'm me? just <laughs> <laughs> Yes, exactly. And it's like, so I'm always just waiting for that moment where like, I'll see a, an astrology post or something and it'd be like, you know, the top three worst signs ever in humanity that just need to burn and, da, da, da. and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be on there. And I just anticipate it. So when I'm not on there, I, I get pleasantly surprised by that. And I'm like, also people tell me a lot that I don't really fully fit uh, some of the Gemini criteria or like they've met a lot of Geminis and I don't fit that completely. But I, I always tell them, I think like the sun, moon and rising and like the whole chart makes a huge difference too. It certainly does. But I also feel like that is a, that is shade on Gemini because it's like, oh, you don't seem like a Gemini. Well, it's like, what, what a Gemini seem like? Like, creepy <laughs> bitches. Like, like, person, are, like I'm glad that you don't think I am that way, but why do you think all Gemini are that way? <laughs> like, wait, you're not evil. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. So what are, like, when you tell someone that you're a Gemini, what is the type of reaction? Like, what would be a dramatic reaction to you being a Gemini that you have received? Literally, um, ooh, okay, there's like three I usually get. There's one that says, that's the confused, like, hmm, ooh, I, I didn't expect that. And then there's a- Confused, and then there's a, so confused, nervous. <laughs> confused, nervous, like, um, then there's like, uh, I get the bold one where it's like, Oh, so you're two faced. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit. Okay. Um, and then uh, I think the the really like kind of like shady one where it's just like, mm, 
yikes. And, you know, and I'm so just standing there awkwardly like, uh. so how do you feel when that happens? What do you um, say? I just feel like, oh man, this might be so wrong to say, but I feel like just from experience, I feel like a lot of um, signs get a bad rep due to like toxic masculinity and misogyny and just like dating in general I feel like a lot of uh so I used to just joke and be like no no that's that's like the the cishet men <laughs> Gemini's that are ruining it for us all because um like I I once upon a time dated a cishet Gemini man and it was just I was like oh the, the hot and cold nature of this all was just fresh I need consistency like I, I just was like oh this is too much like okay so for the record Brie is saying that it's not all Gemini's that are the problem it is only cishet men Gemini's that are actually the problem <laughs> your fault no, just kidding. <laughs> okay, well, I have an- on the record a little army in my in my twitter dms is coming soon (laughs) no no no. okay like from my vantage as an astrologer obviously like i would never want people to be listening to this podcast and be like oh my god elisa does not like one of the signs or there's one sign that i feel like i you know have create stigma around but i would say that unevolved signs are unevolved signs Mm -hmm. you know like there is the iconic shady gemini man yes. woman whatever the how oh you know gosh, yes. wherever it is in gender mm-hmm. there are creepy gemini's there are egotistic narcissistic leos there are Oof. really dodgy scorpios like Oof. the worst cases do also exist if that person has a lot of work to do on themselves yeah but also all of the the best cases exist for those signs yeah. too and I noticed there's a, a slight difference. Me and my best friend were biased because her birthday's the day after mine. But I said, um, we both kind of pointed out that there seems to be somewhat of a difference between May and June Geminis. Because we're, we're cusp babies, kind of like on that Taurus cusp. I don't know, like, I know you're the expert. I don't know if this has anything to do with that. But when I meet June Geminis, I kind of like, hmm, okay, I could see a few of the stigmas here playing out. And even when you look at like celebrity Geminis, I'm just like, hmm, okay. Some of the toxic ones tend to be June Gemini. <laughs> so I was like, all You're shades like, of June I... Geminis. No, no. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> I hang out with May Geminis. <laughs> <laughs> Exclusively. And they're like, Exclusively all right, Brie, that's like, what, is that what, 10 days? <laughs> <laughs> well, there is from an astrological perspective vantage a uh, evolution that occurs within each zodiac sign mm. so it is and it's not cusp as much as its degrees a zodiac mm. sign is going to start at zero degrees and then it's going to continue to the 29th degree so each wow. each sign is sort of moving through its stages and mm. then it gets into whole like you know you have decans and you have decantes and like all of these like sort of micro categories of the sign yeah. But yeah, I mean, each a sign is not just as simple as a sign. It, it's also mm-hmm. there's there's sub signs within that sign. You know, it's kind of funny you say that because I'm I'm literally thinking I was thinking about like all the nuanced aspects of Gemini's that I'm still unfamiliar with, right? And it's funny when I you know told someone, hey, I'm about to go on Elise's podcast to literally talk about sign like uh my sign and they're like oh yeah like time to get red <laughs> red for film and I was like, it's just a running joke like I feel like I have to have humor as a Gemini around my sign um as just like a coping mechanism well for, I would for- honestly say that that is one of the reasons I adore Gemini so much because mm-hmm. if any other sign got as much shade as Gemini they'd be like fuck astrology this is a toxic <laughs> and horrible craft like this is very cruel but because Gemini yeah intrinsically have such an incredible sense of humor they're like man drag me like it's fine like <laughs> drag me for you, three miles me. like I'm just gonna just sit here no for real, like I that is actually kind of true it, it always surprises me when people like my mom and stuff will tell me I'm funny because it, it I feel like it's very unintentional but I feel like being lighthearted is is kind of natural it's like something that comes quite natural to me because it's just like there's so much like in the world to feel weird about and also I feel like I don't know it could be my sign it could be my also maybe my like you know intersectionality and like my race as well historically like black people coming through and having all these like coping mechanisms and 
making something out of nothing all the time. I feel like those two just interweave a lot where it's just like, I, I love uh, taking like a heavy moment and, and turning it light. But then sometimes I love taking a light moment and turning it heavy. Like, well, that's like, nice Gemini something? duality. That is nice Gemini uh-huh. duality. Uh-huh. Okay, Al- see. Always have to have a pair. <laughs> yeah, and then I think the the connotation is like the pair has to be good and evil, but duality can mean so many different things as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of my least favorite pairs is a good and evil pair. That's like my least mm-hmm. favorite type of duality. I I actually feel like that moral binary is like mm. really toxic and like unnecessary. Um, oh, yeah. I often find that is one of the things that I'm up against the most as an astrologer, where I'll say, mm. you know, we have this transit happening, this astrologically, you know, we have the eclipse right now, we're, yeah. as we're recording this, it's eclipse season. And the question that people ask is like, is it good or bad? And like, not to sound <laughs> is like- Is there such a thing? Right. It's like, <laughs> it is, you know, it just, it mm-hmm. is. And there might be some things that we perceive more positively that come from it. And there might be mm-hmm. some that are seem more negative at face value, but it is, and it's going to tell many stories and it's going to showcase many different types of truth. And oftentimes something that seems negative, like, you know, not getting hired where you think you're going to get hired or a breakup, Mm -hmm. like those types of things actually give way to possibilities that we could have never even imagined. So something that per- it might be perceived negatively at first is actually like an important mm-hmm. step for a much bigger story. Exactly. And I love that you pointed out that moral binary is subjective as well, because I feel like that's something I'm so big on is literally looking at situations. I love like this is something I'm not going to lie, y'all. Like I will kill a vibe really quick because <laughs> I, I, I love looking at like toxic shit and d- deep things that really bother people. And I like to dissect it for fun and just be like, why? I, okay. So like, I haven't even told anybody this. Y'all are probably gonna be like, Brie, what the hell? So I literally like a couple weeks ago, I was like, I don't understand necrophilia. Like, I just don't get it. Well, so I, I like, did not expect <laughs> you to say that. That really, really was the most shocking thing of eclipse season for me so far. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, cause I love like watching like true crime and stuff like that. And just, I love psychology and understanding, you know, what makes people themselves. And I think that's why astrology is also such a, an interesting topic because it's just, I love seeing like, I kind of like even technology, like taking things apart and seeing how they work and then putting them back together and having this newfound understanding. But I was like, I, one of my goals in life is not to have hatred for anyone more so, but understanding I can disagree with things that people have done, but I don't want to hate any, anyone for anything. So I was literally like watching a true crime documentary and I'm just like, what, what makes someone want to do this? Like, I just don't get it. And then I read up on psychology and was like, oh, okay, like that actually makes complete sense. I still don't agree. (laughs) Is is necrophilia having sex with a dead body? Yes, yes. Because they were talking about, it was like a um, documentary. I think it was called, uh, I want to say Crazy Not Insane. I I forgot the name, but it's on on Hulu. Um, And it was about a doctor. She's the one who's studying um dang it the the name has changed it used to be called a uh, multiple personality disorder but now it's called this disassociative this is a disassociative identity per- disorder identity disorder exactly and um, yeah, <laughs> I'm on it <laughs> yes thank you I'm trying to stay current y'all it's just you know you know out there is so much information to stay current on but yeah she was talking about basically how most of the serial killers that um we've had in our societies have had some type of like issues within the frontal lobe as well as some so for, form of a disassociative uh, identity disorder. And one of the facts, sorry, y'all, I'm tangenting like crazy, but- No, this is very important. They, she talked about how she was one of the last people to see Ted Bundy before execution and how he wrote her letter and she noticed that his handwriting in previous letters was different. Woo! Isn't that chills, right? Right. And, and so she, 
hypothesize and she's like, she's like really against the death penalty. Um, so a lot of people disagree with her on things, but she was like, if we kill people that have these illnesses, we cannot study them and we cannot help treat um, people in the future or catch them early, you know, before someone gets to this point of, of deep harm, right? So then they got into the topic of like the levels of necrophilia and like how different serial killers, some do and some don't. So I was just like, that's an interesting common phenomena that I'm just like, curious about what makes someone like that. And okay, fun fact, I know people listening might be actually curious. It was um, people who during childhood had some sort of trauma around rejection and feeling um, unloved or someone who might've had like an abusive household that was heavily critical. So they literally, they were like TMI, but like <laughs> TMI, but they were like a corpse can't judge you cannot criticize you cannot degrade you you know what I mean and can't talk back can't call you ugly can't reject you and things like that so they said that's what why people they said it's like a step above people who use blow-up dolls same oh, yeah, same reason yeah. it makes sense to me I mean it makes sense that you would and then there's like the power dynamic of it also. Like exactly. if all of those, if you have been like rejected and, and shut down, yes. And then, and you need to assert, you need to have a sense of agency and autonomy mm -hmm. and power, then you're going to kill someone, you have sex with them, obviously, <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you? Clearly. Exactly. You do. Um, no, but I, I understand. I have the same brain as you I think <laughs> wanting to understand I feel like this. we relate yeah. yeah and it's like I it's think not it's important. a topic you can bring up with just anybody but it's it's refreshing when people are open to it because I'm like yeah I really want to know when I'm watching things and not just be like oh that you know how people are like that disgusting animal da, 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 da. I'm like you know oh it was there was a quote that I read too it was like um because I I'm really into Buddhism as well and it, it was about seeing the humility in every human on the planet and humanizing yourself and saying that, okay, this person is human just like me. So I have the potential to be anyone on the planet at this current given moment. And that frees me from a place of judgment, you know? Mm -hmm. Because everyone, I feel like there's cause and effect for how everyone becomes, you know? Well, eventually. I think that that is actually one of the main reasons that I have found astrology to be continuously interesting and regenerative is because mm. it continues to expose how totally different people are and how oh, incredibly yeah. similar they are too. Like in a birth chart, the 360 wheel, we have all of the Zodiac signs. So, mm -hmm. you know, the people who are throwing shade at Gemini, like, oops, sorry, you also have Gemini in, in your chart, chart too, <laughs> like, because yeah. you have all of the signs in you and at different mm -hmm. points in your life, they're going to, you're going to feel them and express them differently. But your birth chart, this unique diagram of where the planets and stars were at the moment that you arrived is also really, really special and really mm -hmm. um, individual and very specific to your needs. So it also helps, you know, especially with like couples who are trying to navigate different ways of communicating, different ways of feeling safe. Like mm. let's start by recognizing simultaneously that you are both extremely different and also that you have enough similarities that you can find your mirror in each other. Mm. It might not be a one-to-one, -one, like the way yeah. that you feel safe might not be the way the other person thinks they feel safe in relationships, but maybe the way that you need to feel safe in your professional life is going to help give you insight as to how this person needs to feel safe at home. Yes. And it also is very freeing when you think about it that way, because a lot of times we, we look at our relationships in our life as so fixed. And I've even been going through this transformationally recently where I've had to pivot with some people that I interact with on a daily basis. And then I speak to someone else. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're exactly the person I've been looking for, for this role in my life, this, this, um, you know, even with colleagues and things like that. And, you know, I used to think, oh, this is just how it's going to be. And now I'm pivoting out of that because of realizing, like you said, how different we are. And I love trying to tap into similarities, but sometimes it, you know, I've learned to meet people where they are and not where I am all the time, because some people, you know, aren't ready to meet you at the, the stage you are in your life. Yes, and that's perfectly yes. okay. Yes. <laughs> you know? And it's actually sometimes um, 
ironically disrespectful to try to impose, to ask somebody to give mm. you more to meet them because it's also not seeing them for where they're meeting you to be mm. like, well, I'm meeting you at a hundred percent. Why are you only at 60? It's like, well, why are you trying to get them to come up to a hundred? Like yeah, that's erasure. Go, go down to 60, you know? Mm-hmm. If they can, if they're only able to give you 60% of attention, then don't put the, mm-hmm. don't set them up for failure by demanding a hundred, you know? Yeah. And I'm even guilty of that. I'm not even going to lie. Like, um, you know, I'm somebody and <laughs> my partner mentions this on a frequent basis. He, he literally says, Brie, I have to remind you, you are a very rare person. You, I, and he was like, I know that you think that people think like you and da, 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 da. And he's like, but no, finding someone like you, it's, it's also quite romantic, but he's like, finding someone like you is actually very, very difficult and rare. So he said, you need to cherish that you are rare. And then like, you know, because I'm also like sensitive, I think, (laughs) I think we mentioned the Scorpio move, but like (laughs) literally, literally like I'm a, I feel like I'm a, um, not an Oreo, maybe no Twinkies are soft all the way through, but I'm like, just something <laughs> with a soft filling. <laughs> maybe you are a crunch wrap supreme. A crunch wrap supreme. <laughs> with the Baja Blast on the side, y'all. But literally, <laughs> and it's that, like, now that is romance. <laughs> My right, true romance. Food and, and I are just <laughs> one. But it, it, that, like, hearing that puts so much into perspective, right? Because um, when people would do things that would, you know, hurt my feelings in some way or something like that, I just couldn't, like, there was a time in my life I just couldn't understand. Like, you know, all, all I need is this one thing. Like, why why is this so difficult for them when I feel like it's it's not that difficult, right? Maybe it's like to com- just send a text or, you know, things like that. But of course, that, that was, you know, more immature, I guess, version of myself. And now I have to realize, okay, like I'm somebody who is, you know, maybe, maybe through trauma too, but like a very, very committed to like growth and understanding things and very imperfect, but very aware of my imperfection at the same time. And I realized that, you know, some people are, you know, everyone's on their journey. Um, There's this rap quote uh, from, I forgot what song it's from, but I, I always think about this quote. Um, it's like we uh, walk the same path, but have on different shoes, live in the same building, but we have different views and then um, different levels, different devils kind of thing. So like everybody's going through things, but seeing them differently. Oh, I and love I- that. That's so that's beautiful. Yes. Uh, I, I, sorry, y'all. It's a credit, but um, Google those lyrics. Uh, they're definitely a very popular song. I just, I, that's a lyric that I've remembered since high school and whenever I'm coming to a crossroads where I don't understand, like, especially being like multiple minorities, when someone just can, cannot absorb uh, the understanding of my experience fully in any way, um, I have to remember that they're, I'll just think, okay, I'm on the East wing, they're on the West wing of this building. So they're seeing a flower garden. Meanwhile, I'm seeing like a a fucking shootout and bomb squad approaching, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. they have a, maybe like a a spot that they just cannot physically see from my point of view. And that, yes, (laughs) I think that it's so, you know, at the time of this recording, as I had mentioned, eclipse Mm -hmm. season, Every, this happens every eclipse season to me. I was born on a lunar eclipse. So I have, you know, the eclipses are very electric in my life. And I don't know if it's, you know, a chicken or egg situation, but (laughs) eclipse season, I come around and I say, okay, eclipse season, we want to, you know, take a pause on our manifestation practice. We're, you Mm -hmm. know, we're kind of like not intention setting. We're not charging our crystals. We're really letting the, the energy is very chaotic. So we're letting the cosmos do mm-hmm. their thing. The wow. pushback on this that I get on the internet is extraordinary. And really? it's, yeah, it's, I, and I am very grateful, mm-hmm. you know, knock on wood that generally speaking, I have, mm-hmm. I don't get a lot of, I don't get a lot of trolls. You know, I have a, mm-hmm. a I feel very fortunate on social media that that hasn't been a mainstay in my experience other than, mm-hmm in eclipse season, specifically when I say, 
don't manifest during eclipse season. Suddenly everybody is like, who is this bitch? What does she know? (laughs) What are her sources? And I, just before our podcast today, I went through and I had, I had been dealing with some family stuff. So I hadn't really been on social Mm -hmm. media. And I saw all my, these comments of like, just like like rebellion in the comment section. Sheer people, rebellion. Yes, yeah, sheer rebellion. <laughs> I'm following. Who is this? Bitch? I rebuke oh, this. Yeah. And I, mm-hmm. it's like, what the fuck are you guys doing? Like, <laughs> you don't, if you want to go fucking manifest, I don't give a fuck. Like, this is just my practice and I'm scary. sharing it's my page. Experience. But I also remember that social media is just projection you know, and it Mm, really is just what people are projecting onto each other. So how Mm -hmm. do you, Brie, with 700 fucking thousand subscribers on YouTube, and I'm sure many more high numbers across the different platforms, how do you manage all of that projection? Because it is, it is a lot of people. It is so overwhelming. That is actually a really good question. Um, And honestly, I did have to take like a social media break um, especially last year, I took quite a bit, like I was still working with my teams and, you know, things like that and doing sponsorships here and there, you know, we got to keep the lights on, but I literally, uh, had to take a break because also what I will say is the culture of the internet and YouTube and social media has changed drastically mm. since when I started, I started YouTube in the days, shout out to anybody who knows about th- this time period, but like, um, when, when, girls on YouTube who did makeup would ship each other boxes of their favorite makeup and do um, an unboxing and you say, oh, doing my makeup with so-and-so's favorite products. And like those, just those wholesome videos. That sounds so charming. Yeah. And I I really want to get back to that place. But I also realized that um, in order to thrive and survive, you have to evolve with society in in certain aspects right you don't have to but if you want to be in entertainment you kind of do but um so what I do when it comes to projection is number one having a strong strong support system and friend group I'm not gonna lie y'all I was not feeling like myself like this past year and really just turned off from social media a bit like just sharing because I Y'all, like, I put out a cooking video and someone was like, ugh, the way that she cooks garlic is so cringe. And literally, like, she's chopping up the herbs with scissors. Number one, they are kitchen shears, okay? That's like like, a very normal thing. That's literally what they're in the nice set for. I know a lot of us families use the kitchen shears to cut open, like, normal things and stuff. That's what they're for. Anywho. So like, yeah, you you see your expression right now of sheer, like utter, just like, what the fuck? That's the the feeling like, so I will go into these places with a sheer joy about what I'm sharing. And it's like a a trend now online to just like, think, what is the, the, where can I find something wrong? It's like, we're scanning everything for something that we can tear apart and we get praise for finding errors in things, right? So one thing I do is I have a strong support system. So if someone is questioning like something I said on Twitter or whatever, like I get a lot of white supremacists in my, in my DMs with the death threats. And I'm just like, (laughs) oh, by the way, I, I may respond if I just feel a little cheeky that day, but nine times out of 10, I'm getting your page taken down. Like that is my new, just, just pride and joy. It brings me sheer bliss. Like I report (laughs) white supremacists all day, every day, like Anywho, so like, yeah, just taking measures to protect myself online, I think is also another thing. Um, I know now which words can be very triggering based on my moral compass. And I know some people are like, oh, you know, they don't allow comments because they can't handle criticism. I'm like, handling criticism from 1.3 million people is not natural to anybody. Right. I don't care if how big of a celebrity you are. It's not natural. Most celebrities don't even read magazines or tabloids for their for their sanity sake right so I blacklist the n-word I blacklist like um oh just like fake (laughs) you know I blacklist the word ad because I'm like like if on YouTube somebody's like oh oh my gosh she has three ads in this video like y'all like this is a free platform like I you know what I'm saying there's things you see how I'm already getting riled up like oh like yeah like yeah. I'm upset that I'm you know 
spending 13, 14 hours from planning to filming, to lighting, to doing this video, to editing it, to metadata and uploading and spending an hour to answer comments. And, and people are like complaining about a 15 second ad is just like mind boggling. Cause I literally sit through people's ads and initially I'd be like, oh, and then I'm like, nah, get your coin girl. Like I literally snap out of it and, and celebrate their ads because I'm like, this is the least I can do with a, how much effort they probably put into this. So yeah, I just blacklist a bunch of words that they don't even show up on my page and they automatically go to like a, a review box. And that is something that's helped me tremendously because I used to have so much anxiety mm. around my comment section. I'd be at dinner and be like, oh, what if somebody, because sometimes you can have one negative comment that's about something so small. Like they're like, oh, that hair that dropped down onto her forehead is bothering me. And then suddenly a thousand people are liking that comment. And then that's a top comment and no one's talking about anything else. So it's like, guys, you know, I, I spent days on this and we're talking oh, about a piece of hair like it's so, so heartbreaking yeah so like I used to kind of just constantly obsessively check my comments um because I just didn't want to derail the hard work I put in mm -hmm. with something minuscule now I leave up a lot of criticism though I leave up like if it, if it's constructive and things I'll reply to it and leave it up you know like what I, would be constructive criticism um Hey, Brie, uh, the audio was a little off in this video. Oh, like I'll that's like that a about. technical. Yeah, that's like a literal yeah. technical note. And I can literally, and I'll thank people for that. But like saying the way I cook garlic is cringy is not constructive criticism. Right. I mean, that's what I was also thinking is like these, like of, you know, having millions of people watching, like yeah. if every million, if every person has a constructive piece of feedback that's still mm -hmm. a million it's so hurtful helpful. things oh well yeah that is true that is very <laughs> true yeah because nobody wants to see themselves in a light especially like I'm super sensitive to certain energies um because so you're even, psychic yes yes even on Twitter um you know I I just want to emphasize like like it's so important to go off of someone's character. Now there is things that we see online where or are things we see online where it's blatant, like, okay, like they're breaking the law, law, like, or, you know, like the people are, you know, all these assault scandals going on on YouTube with these big YouTubers that like, okay, like run it up trolls, but you know, literally, <laughs> <laughs> literally <Right>. like <laughs> this is your season go. <laughs> yes. And one of the things that I've pointed out, oh, I'm so glad I just thought about this because it applies to me. It, it may not be universal, but I feel this way. If you are, if the uh, criticism you're giving is truly constructive and out of care, you'll do it in private. I really do feel that way because um, when we do see someone do a big thing and it's just like, hey, your nipples out, like, you know, you'll see that on, on, on like a try on haul, right? you're drawing all this attention and now like the comment section you can get likes on your comment right so it's like was this for the creator or was this so other like you know you'll see people like who agrees that this is the worst video of all time and it'll get a thousand likes or da da so like people are getting dopamine and 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 that feeling of validation from hating people and and saying negative things or criticizing right and when I reflected on myself, there's not a single person that I criticized publicly that I respected. Donald Trump. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> literally, like, but when I think about it, I've, I've known even YouTubers that had scandals around uh, old tweets, right? And there was, I've only done this once, y'all. Y'all know who some of them are, then, and it's not who, who you're thinking of, because absolutely <laughs> not. But, um, but there was one person that had a scandal around old tweets, and guess what? Because I had met this person and everything and spent time around them. And I was even personally affected by some of them because they were very racist streets from many years ago. I sent them a DM, you know what I mean? And I, I expressed, Hey, this is how this made me feel. Um, here, like, here are some sources of like things that you can follow up on. And, you know, uh, 
just hoping to see like a change in behavior and a true commitment to growing out of this. And that person ended up mentioning me in a future video as they were, you know, actively getting involved in different organizations and things to help learn and, and uh, like deprogram that mm -hmm. in their mind. So if I respect you, I feel like people are more receptive to private criticism as well. Well, private criticism is completely different than uh, publicly, you know, making a snarky Spectacle. public, exactly, which I mean, let's be honest, is there to try to create sort of like a, its own um, fandom around. Yes, yes. Like, I, I, on a smaller scale on this eclipse bullshit, I, someone posted this like very elaborate comment you know, elaborate. literally <laughs> elaborate, like, whole essay. and then at the end of it, they were like, if you're interested, you know, come follow my page. And it was like, oh, Aren't you promoting so, on not, so it was a promo. <laughs> so it was a promo. Like, so this really rude, wow. disrespectful interaction was a way for you to try to siphon followers to follow you and That's get absurd. likes on your shit so that you can then promote and then it's like but then I understand because it's like okay you're trying They're to trying start to an astrology you. practice you're trying yeah. to start some sort of a magical thing you don't have the you don't have the following you haven't figured out your fucking secret sauce so yeah. what you're doing is you're doing it antithetical to people who have worked like myself for fucking mm -hmm. 10 years really hard to yes. create the uh insight that I offer Exactly. which makes it so easy to do that if you're like <laughs> wrong come follow me I did one Google right. search and she is tripping like what right <laughs> and I think so, that's another big issue is people will do that one Google search and you're not even on Google Scholar like can we get some peer-reviewed sources please thank you um literally I'm like not you looking and they'll be like my source is Twitter and I'm like you know what please, please. right and then I, I'm also recently getting my sources TikTok which is also like okay Okay. I don't think Wikipedia even takes TikTok as a legitimate source, but like, fine. Okay. Cool. Oh my gosh. I'm glad a 14 year old told you something about astrology. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> glad to hear it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> if I, if I went off of and got internet fame off of all the things I was wrong about at 14, like I can't even imagine the mass hysteria that would have ensued online from from everything I'm like yeah it just and I, not even to be like ageist or anything because I know well I knew at the time an eight-year-old who was like way brighter than some of the 50-year-olds I know so totally totally <laughs> totally literally I, mean, I think that teenagers have incredible amounts of wisdom but I don't think TikTok is a source <laughs> I don't I will stand Agreed. by that <laughs> Agreed. I don't think that it is a source that can be sourced <laughs> absolutely and the only people i even trust on tiktok is people that like like okay they literally will get up and show their degree placards and things like okay i've worked this long in this i worked this long like there's someone i even follow who she's studied um what is it like basically oppression and she's like i got she said i went to three ivy league schools to study oppression like i just needed to understand misogyny <laughs> and i was wow. like wow queen but first yeah, of all totally. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so funny like she still gets those trolls like mansplaining to her but it's funny because I love the clap like an educated clap back just chef's kiss amazing like literally she'll be like oh see um the reason you're saying this and bringing up what you do with your kids is because people often project using examples from the area they feel most insecure about, which would be parenting for you. And literally <laughs> like, I'm just like, oh, bitch. Like, <laughs> yeah, that is, that is a, a really thoughtful clapback. And I love thoughtful clapbacks. Yes. There's and, and people have every right to do offer a thoughtful clapback if somebody is leaving those kind of comments. I mean, I mm -hmm. guess if I were to sum it all up, put a little bow on it, and then there was a message. It would say, like, try to not perpetuate negativity and violence on social media. If you Oof, really yes. genuinely have a problem with something that somebody posted, and especially if it's like a non-political thing, <laughs> like message yeah. them and try to have a, or a quest, you know, you could ask a thoughtfully worded question, like that's no problem, but to say something bitchy 
just to try to siphon followers for yourself is literally perpetuating violence. Like it is, that is what at the heart of it, it's doing. And I feel like so many of us are guilty of that too. Like, I mean, I've even been there granted. Yes. I was projecting and I was super fucking triggered. Like it was, um, there's a, a YouTuber I used to follow who just went into the deep end of like conservative (laughs) oh my gosh it's so I it's like that is becoming such a trope like that's not even a that's not even a rant like a wild one-off anymore that's like something that you hear about more and more which is so (laughs) fucking scary I I did make a good joke though guy I I would like to tell my joke please do please do I'd love a good joke I'm retiring from my um re-trolling people that are spewing hatred but so this person literally I know a lot of people probably know who I'm talking about because it went viral but like this person (laughs) literally wears foundation that's like four shades too dark for them and they are white and they also wear now like sew-ins and weaves and things that are a little bit curlier and wavier than their natural hair texture and (laughs) river has it they told another youtuber who's huge oh yeah it seems like people like you are in right now like you're getting all the brand deals because they're trying to diversify no I am so serious I'm so serious so I made this joke because she was trying to use like the bible to justify um like being anti-black and like conservative things meanwhile she's like trying to look racially ambiguous so I said, girl, I literally quote tweeted one of the things she said about just like, it was just so wrong. I said, girl, if Jesus was here today, you would probably gaslight him and steal his foundation shades at Sephora. And everybody was crying. <laughs> but like, seriously, I had to, I could not y'all. Oh like. my God. I am <laughs> obsessed with that. That is so amazing. I also, <laughs> because yeah, like what would be the world that Jesus would walk into today? Yeah. It would be a world where you have Sephora's. <laughs> Period. Jesus shade at Sephora. <laughs> I would like to think that Jesus would have a mad blend game and a cut crease. Like I, I would oh like it. Oh my god, I am so for that. That is <laughs> the incredible. the gem that's like I would like to see it. <laughs> I feel truly that if Jesus were here today, mm-hmm. he would be uh, like really fabulous. He would like absolutely. Really, he would be. He would look incredible. He would be really experimental. He would be really progressive. He would be absolutely yeah and he would probably be an influencer oh yeah and that's the <laughs> whole he was. irony he was <laughs> that's the whole irony not to get like super political but I'm always down to get super political <laughs> um <laughs> literally it's funny because like being conservative there's so many things in conservative nature that just go directly contradict the very book that they're using to be conservative I'm like I'm like didn't I was like in that book, we're talking about immigrants being rescued from, like, and slaves being rescued from bondage and doing right by, you know, the people that were in bondage and also feeding the the sick and the poor. And then also, <laughs> like, swarms of locusts attacking the, the people that did, that did wrong and had no remorse. So I'm like, if you don't want to be, like, eaten by swarms of locusts I think (laughs) yeah I also like one of the things that really stands out to me is that idol worship was one uh, was like so problematic and then Mm -hmm. like the conservative conservative um re I mean I guess rebranding rebranding yeah (laughs) of, of Jesus and Mary and the whole crew is like just making them idols because yeah. it's not making them nuanced individuals or allowing room for nuance, allowing mm. room for multidimensionality and complexity. And it becomes, I mean, actually coming full circle, that moral binary of right and wrong and good and evil when like life is so much more multidimensional and so much more layered than that as it should oh, be. Oh my gosh. So much more complex. Yeah. And that's and why that's it's beautiful. hard to like disagree with someone in that mind frame because they will just like regurgitate the same script over and over and just so closed off to any new perspectives where I feel like a lot of people who are leftists and things like that are open to constantly learning. And once you realize something's wrong and I mean, some, not all, like we cannot generalize like that. That's the whole point of, you know, the podcast as well. It was, you know, 
but like you said, finding the individuality amongst people. Also, I wanted to bring it back to a quick thing that you were mentioning too about um, manifesting during eclipse season. I actually wanted to ask you, why don't you manifest during eclipse season? Well, there's like a practical answer. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a like the technical answer is simply that the sun and the moon, which are the luminaries, which are mm -hmm. our day-to-day -day planets, our celestial bodies are yeah. obstructed. They're in shadow. They are not oh, wow. functioning normally. They are, um, wow. they are not, they are shifting their perspective in a way that obviously us as recipients of the cosmos, as participants in the cosmos, we are also obstructed. We are also in shadow. We are also not seeing things clearly. It's not negative by any means. It doesn't need to be, but it's not necessarily, we're not in a state of mind where mm -hmm. we can really clarify and know what exactly we want. This is a time to look at things from a different point of view because the sun mm. and the moon are, you know, the moon is yeah. fucking red. The sun is yeah. uh, like day becomes night. Like these are, you might not manifest shit. exactly what you're, you know, exactly. what's so fascinating. I love, love, love like that answer and, and the reasoning behind it. That makes complete sense. Yeah. It's very logical. Yeah. And, and the other reason, which is more subjective is that mm -hmm. I think it's important to take a break from manifesting. I think it's important mm, to- Absolutely. You know, to like, just cool things down, look yeah, around. Overwater also, your plants. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Find some gratitude for what you have. Mm, like wow, find yes. a little humility for what you don't have and what you are aspiring to create. And instead of just constantly being on that churning cycle of more and more and more, like also yes. kind of checking in with yourself and being like, wait, is the thing that I thought I wanted six months ago still what I want today? But you don't, if you're just going and going and going, you don't have that break to really reflect mm -hmm. and to re-examine where you're at and what you want to be creating. And anything that is done mm -hmm. mechanically um, ends up being disconnected from our, in, our soul, our truth, our intention. Yeah. So I also separately from like the technical uh, spatial aspects of things. I also consider just, you know, every six months it's why not take six weeks off of manifesting to just be present, you know? Yeah. I, you know, I had like this, this really fascinating thought when you said this too. All right, hear me out. Okay. And I've got literal goosebumps thinking about it. Um, since I feel like we are the universe and the universe is us, I think, and this probably is out there already. I feel like people can eclipse us. Definitely. And I literally, because I was like, how many times have y'all out there listening, had somebody in your life who you held on to um, for either personal reasons or you felt like guilty about letting them go. But the moment you let them go, it felt like the, the sun came out. It felt like everything realigned beautiful new things started being invited into your life. Beautiful new people started coming into your life and room was made for the appropriate connections. I was like, I feel like just hearing about how things can't connect the way they need to when there's a blockage is such a fascinating Yes, yeah, and sometimes our, uh, our intentions, our manifestations can also eclipse us, you know? Wow, yeah. Like if we are you know, like the person who's like, I have to meet a husband. I have to get pregnant by this time. I have to get this. I have to have this amount of money. Mm -hmm. I need this in order to validate myself. They no longer become, uh, they're, they're no longer in touch with what actually who, who they are. They become mm. sort of like these Frankensteins of their manifestation. Yeah, exactly. And wow. if we manifest during an eclipse and this isn't, I mean, we're talking about spirituality people, like it, yes. it doesn't have to be this, but in my mm -hmm. practice, I think this is a great opportunity to not let your goals and your intentions become capitalistic spirituality, yes. you know, like exactly. where you actually can just back off for a second, assess, examine, mm -hmm. be a co-creator with your yeah. own spiritual practice by mm -hmm. allowing, um, new frame new points of view and frames of reference yeah. to come to the surface rather than just like i want i want i want exactly and it, this also brings up a good uh point about fate versus free will that i love 
talking about where people are like, what's the difference between fate and free will? And I always just use an example. I thought of like fate is we were destined to meet, right? Like free will is in one dimension or one way of our story. I was supposed to meet you at the library. Mm -hmm. But then my professor stopped me on the way out of class to ask me something. So I ended up not going to the library and going straight to my dorm. But then I ended up meeting you at a party, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like um, that's that's such an interesting thing about manifesting and, and wanting to do it at the appropriate times and also um, leaving room for free will because a lot of times people will want things but want them a certain, done a certain way. And I feel like you can manifest the, the destination but not necessarily the journey mm -hmm. 100%. At mm -hmm. least in my experience, like, I'll be like, um, one of the things I'll say every couple of years when I need a little cleanse, energy cleanse in my life, I'll say, remove any energy that is basically stifling or not uh, positive for my journey and trajectory and free anyone who I'm blocking as well. Mm -hmm. So free us both, right? But whoo. Y'all be ready when you say that because it might be someone you were not <laughs> expecting. Totally. You was actually pointing at the person over there. And mind you, the, the person you were thinking of when you manifested that might actually become neutral with you and no longer <laughs> toxic. It was just a misunderstanding. And then your best man, your friend, your home skillet biscuit of 13, 14 years might be the person that is removed. And you're just like, what the, wait a damn minute. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and I think that that also is, you know, when you are a magical, powerful, witch practitioner, mm -hmm. uh, soulful being, which, you know, a lot of the people who are obviously listening to this podcast are, you obviously are, like, mm -hmm. there is, you do have to be careful, right? And you have to yeah. know that in saying, like, I am only going to put myself on a path that is aligned with my highest purpose means that you might lose your friends, you know, you might mm -hmm. lose your job because yep. it's not, if that's not in your highest purpose and you gave the universe those direct orders, like you might not be ready for that. So it's okay mm -hmm. to be gradual also. And it's okay to take six weeks off to just like yep. check in with yourself and see what's yeah. actually going on so that you can catch your breath before you just start mm -hmm. chopping off your friends left and right, you know? Yeah. And sometimes a good manifestation is uh, send me what I need. Yes. You know, sometimes they're more ambiguous because sometimes the negative, like quote unquote negative experiences, I was just talking about this, like around my birthday, um, how had I not gotten, like I got rejected from one college, right? It was my, my dream school. Had I not been rejected from that school and get this, there was a, a state science fair. I wasn't even supposed to go. My teacher out of 80 students was like, all right, we need someone to go to the Saturday science fair and take their, their science project. In my senior year of high school, I'm already mentally checked out of everything. <laughs> and literally everybody's ducking. She's like, no volunteers, no volunteers. All right, Brie, I'm sending you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to get up at 8 a.m. on a Saturday. Like what kind of evil is this, right? And I was just dragging my feet, went there. I ended up winning the science fair um, and computer Whoa. science that gave me a, and then I was awarded a giant check for a scholarship to a school that I hadn't even thought about applying to. I ended up, I think, no, I did apply, but kind of like last minute through the common app. Then I had a full tuition scholarship, ended up going there. And literally last week, the friend group that I was finally able to reunite with and my best friend of half a decade now, I met them all at that institution. So wow. I would have never had this friend group, these experiences that I that I cherish and all this stuff. Like my literal support system was built from the ground up, like at that school. My my, you know, you go through those phases of like young adulthood and like growing out of high school and stuff. But my now young adult, like 20s support system and friend group was birthed there. And I'm sure I would have made friends anywhere you know wherever I went but I really think my friend group is very special you know and, yeah, and I yeah, cherish yeah. them so like I always uh beg you guys just when when you're when you're going through a negative time that's something that helps me so deeply is think about a negative time that resulted in something that you cannot like imagine your life without today 
Totally. And then think of, and then just, you know, have that thought. What if this moment is to bring me to another person, place, or thing that I would not be able to imagine my life without a few years from now? Totally. Right? Totally. And then like also trusting that, you know, sometimes when something doesn't go according to the plan that you had in mind, mm -hmm. like you don't need to course correct for that instantaneously. Yes. Like you can just see what happens. Sit in it, literally Period. make mistakes. Yo Yolo was a powerful, <laughs> powerful little manifestation right there. I literally, I said there was a time in my life, like actually ugh, last week, okay. I literally decided like, okay, I'm going to try to just challenge and push myself to conquer a few fears I had. And for the first time in my life, I jumped into open water. I've always, you know, I can tread and all those things. And I've been able to like, you know, in a pool, go from the shallow to the deep end. But I'm not the type of person that runs and jumps in the deep end, right? Figuratively, literally, however you may take That's that. That's so beautiful. That's so poetic. Thank you. And I, I finally just did it. And I, I remember looking, looking, looking at the edge. And I had to have this moment where I looked behind me and I said, who's jumping in if I don't come up after six seconds? Oh. And then somebody volunteered and I was like, okay. And I just remember just saying over and over in my head, I'm protected. I'm protected. Oh. That's so beautiful. Yeah. And then I jumped in and like the bubbles and everything just propelled me right back to the surface. And I remember just looking around with this awe, just like, I'm, I'm just, I, I did it. Like I oh, did. Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. I, oh my gosh. That's so amazing. It's been one of the most rewarding experiences to even have gone through that. And, um, you know, so this thing that used to just terrify me, I've now opened so many doors in my life because- Though I didn't like, so I'm, I literally jumped off, uh, this might sound crazy, <laughs> I jumped off a cliff, like a, literally a, like a small cliff into open water. You know how people do cliff diving and stuff? Oh my God. That's so when I really say I went for it, it, I went for it. So the first few times I did it, yes, I did it multiple times, y'all, because <laughs> that, that should tell you that too. If there's something you've been waiting to try, you never know. You might get over the initial funk and it might become one of your favorite things. Um, but I did it a few times with life jacket from the higher heights. And then I was like, terrified to do it with no goggles or life jacket for the shallow end and I ended up just holding my nose as hard as I could and it was just it reminded me of something Will Smith said a long time ago where he said fear doesn't make sense your most of your fear doesn't make sense he said that he was going skydiving and he said I'm he said I'm nervous to the point where I can barely eat breakfast the morning of I'm nervous the night before I'm nervous when I'm being you know uh I'm at the 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 plane and we're boarding and everything and he said but the moment that the instructor they said they go on two because most people hold at three he said the moment that we were out of the plane and I had to let go he said there was no fear in my heart all everything it was pure utter bliss because he you're doing it and he said most of our fears are happening when we're not even anywhere near the source right, of what right, we're afraid right, of right 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 and that's, that's really what happened to me. Like the moment that my toes left the edge of that rock, I just, it right. was it's like, like it the was anticipation. Sink or swim. It's the anticipation of the thing as opposed to anticipation, the thing itself. Anticipation, a hundred percent. And oh, like something I was curious about too, because this is my, my, we, we were talking about this a lot when I reunited with some of my friends, um, finally, like. Cause I noticed, oh, you want to hear something really interesting. My best friend actually has the same, um, sun and moon. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I love that. That's your Gemini twin. I, I really do feel that way. And she just has a different rising, her, her risings in Taurus. And, um, my other good friend who was there has the same moon and rising as me. So we were noticing a lot of overlap in our charts. And when we were all sitting at the table, just discussing these things. And it was just like, whoa, wait a second. So I was like, let me make sure I bring this to the show this week. Cause I, I did ask these questions. So what are some things I was really curious about? I feel like my Scorpio moon has a lot of dominance in my life. So like, um, I was curious if you could tell me more about like uh, some of the things that I know you predicted that moon for me, but what are some things that you, I know it's not like a monolith, but like notice about Scorpio moons. Scorpio moons 
Uh, this it's I, I like that you asked that because Scorpio Moon is I, I recently on Instagram did like a question box mm -hmm. and a lot of people asked about like how do you get a Scorpio Moon to open up or like how do I work with wow. my Scorpio Moon? I know you're like who said that? <laughs> right, <laughs> like uh, open book over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scorpio Moon is so the Moon sign, your emotional inner world, how you mm -hmm. feel about things. Yeah, shows you not just um, how you want to be nurtured. It also shows the ways that you maybe weren't nurtured. It mm. shows what you, Ooh. it shows what you could have been lacking in addition to what you received. And so it could show like wow. where it was, there was a compensation, right? So like my Pisces moon, um, I'm really very si sensitive, very psychic, very creative, very um, mm -hmm. musical, but yeah. I also wasn't very, protected in tangible ways. So mm -hmm. I have like an over, um, like it's what's the word that I'm looking for. It's like, I have a overdeveloped in a way like mm -hmm. spiritual, magical safety and know how to do that because I didn't have like, my mom wasn't very good at like food and like yeah. security and like other things. So like mm. in lieu of those tangible things, I have like a very rich spiritual world, but it also shows where you have that, you know, you created that in the void of those things. So for yeah. the Scorpio moon, wow. which is also a water sign, it's like you have a lot of intensity. You are a very intense person. Yes. You feel a very intense things, but it could also show that maybe intense things weren't allowed in your house or like they would become problematic Ooh, or they would, wow. it would be hard for you to make to talk about nuance because you would get in trouble for it you know so yes. it's like your what actually brings you safety isn't just because you had that as safety it also shows where you compensated for not having mm -hmm. something so with the Scorpio moon, who is a very, you know, there is privacy is really important for a Scorpio moon. Yes. And the reason that we don't yes. try oh to disrespect gosh. that is because it's not just because they like it. It's also survival, you know, like your mm -hmm. emotional privacy is not just like your nice to have. It's like, I need this in order to feel safe because I had to cultivate this to feel safe or else I wouldn't have had this at all. Yes. And, and it's been such an evolution. That is so fascinating that you just said that because that's very, very true. You know, I, I first generation, um, me and my mom's relationship has evolved a lot. Like we're, we're really good at like, um, talking through things now and just like getting, getting, how do I put it? Like my mom doesn't take anything personally anymore as like, condemning you know when I talk mm -hmm. about my own experiences during childhood it used mm -hmm. to be like oh by talking about you you're talking about me and it's like no it's not necessarily always the sometimes but <laughs> <laughs> it's not always the case and um that's very very true because growing up with a single parent um there was like my mom did acknowledge that she like developed the silent treatment from one of her parents mm -hmm. and so there were those times of like oh conflict breeds the silent treatment which when I wasn't as mature into my studies and things like that did lead me into the realms of abuse and things because I did subconsciously see intensity as a form of uh, compassion care yeah and compassion mm -hmm. and a lot of people think oh like that's so absurd like she thinks that that be you know being physical or aggressive is no, not at all. I've never thought that way, but I think it's important for us to also acknowledge our subconscious when epiphanies about our subconscious arrive, um, because that's something that I had to realize. And once you realize, uh, it's kind of like within the shadow work, but once you realize that there are parts of you that you dislike, but can also be found in healthy relationships and partnerships for example i know very well i like i crave intensity i love emotional intensity i create with emotional intensity like i will literally imagine a drawing in my head before i like paint it and i will tear up because i know like how how it will come out based on what i saw in my mind and so i realized you know through growing and, and learning oh i don't have to seek intensity in a toxic way I can have a partner, like my current partner has a backbone, doesn't take any <laughs> shit, right? Um, we we will disagree, right? But when I we, when we disagree, it's about who cares like the most, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
oh, but I did this because I, I because I cared about making sure that you had this on time. It's like, oh, but I did this because I was waiting like, oh my gosh. You know what? Prime example, last night, literally, <laughs> we talked about this. Like um, I usually, because I also am neurodivergent, I have ADHD, I was about to wrap up for the night, but I noticed my partner was still working on something. So I was like, oh, I could get some more things prepped for the evening. So I was like naturally just kind of like waiting for them to wrap up. But then my partner kind of like what started to not feel too well. So went to lay down and fell asleep. And if you have ADHD or neurodivergent or know someone like that, I hyper-focused for four hours, not knowing that they went to sleep already because I thought they would knock on my office door. So that's an example of a disagreement we have where it's like, oh, we were both doing something like he said, he, you know, I called your name, but of course, hyper-focus couldn't hear it. Mm-hmm. So it was like, oh, I left you alone because I thought you were in deep focus mode and I didn't want to disturb you. And it's like, I was in deep focus mode because I wanted to wait for you. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So like, that's what a disagreement with me and my partner look like now. Whereas it's not toxic. It's not all these things, but it does create that emotional intensity. Let's be real. Like, right, right. You know, where, where you have that the passionate talk where it's like, no, it's because this is what I was doing and, da, 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 and they're like but you have to understand and it's one of those things but then it's all bliss after like 10 minutes you know yes and I think that with in leaving in recognizing that you can find like a intensity you can find um passion mm. in ways that are not destructive destructive yes that's period that takes time but it's also, yes. it's the, like, mm-hmm. I, to my, my younger self could never imagine genuinely, like truth be told, I could never imagine being in a healthy functional relationship and mm-hmm. still like, and feeling satisfied because yes. I craved chaos. And I thought mm-hmm. that only through chaos would I be able, like, I, I idolized genuinely a really tumultuous like mm-hmm. complicated, sexy, romantic, like all over the place relationship. Yeah, like because Twilight. I, very. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and like partially this is like the media's responsibility. And then the other yes. part is like, I grew up in a really chaotic environment. So for mm-hmm. me, like that was an easy, like I can recreate that. And the process of being with my now fiance, but like through the years that we've been together where we have a healthy, honest, loving, mm-hmm. supportive, kind relationship, in my early twenties, I would have been like grossed out by it, you know, yes. <laughs> I really would have been grossed out because it seemed, it would have seemed boring, but yeah. to my younger self and to anyone listening who is in that state of mind where a, a, like a healthy relationship sounds mm. boring. Like I can assure you it is not boring. It is At just all. as dramatic. It is just as much of a mind fuck, except it's healthy. It's like, it's healthy, it's healthy and you're growing and you're healing mm-hmm. instead of spiraling and going yeah. deeper into your trauma. You are actually evolving together. And I think that healing mm-hmm. is actually much more sexy and much more complicated and much more nuanced than just like, you know, being in an abusive relationship. At yeah. This point, at this oh, point, period, that. period. That's, and you, oh, I, now that you say that you made me think of something when uh an old therapist who actually was like the worst okay but she dropped some <laughs> gems. she dropped some gems um so back in the day she literally told me when I was going through a really like you know the only I don't want to make it seem like I'm just like someone who's always in toxic relationships but I feel like in the one really really toxic abusive relationship I've been in that was where I learned so much about myself and just like what will not be tolerated at period and things like that but she explained to me why some of these behaviors are quite enticing and she said you're in a slot machine relationship mm. and she's like so every day that you wake up you're pulling the lever mm-hmm. and you don't know what you're going to get and they and she's literally said toxicity triggers the abuse centers in your uh, brain and the uh, addiction centers in your brain where you can literally get addicted to a toxic person because you're it's it's extreme highs and extreme lows and every day it's a gamble right but what i will say to the people listening out there a healthy relationship is that direct deposit okay <laughs> you know what i'm saying it's the so amount true. might be different each time it's you might get so a different true. but it's those so, uh, think about how satisfying it is when the direct deposit hits okay 
we're going shopping this weekend. We are putting into savings. We're investing. You know what I'm saying? We're building a life when the direct deposit hits. When the slot machine hits, it's like, are we losing everything? And I think that's something about toxic, I guess, like friendships and romantic relationships is that that constant uncertainty. It's like you're certainly uncertain. Certainly <laughs> uncertain. Yes. 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 Oh my gosh. Brie, it is always such a pleasure to talk to you. I could talk yes. to you forever. Um, for real. <laughs> but for our listeners who are also now need more, where can we find you? Where where can we find your new podcast? And how can we keep in touch with your journey? Thank you so much. So as we've talked about with Gemini's having many names <laughs> on streaming platforms, my artist and creative name is Lahara, L-A space H-A-R-A. And for all other like social media platforms, it's at Brie Hall official and it's spelled B-R-I. Some people spell it like the cheese, uh, but yeah, it's just <laughs> B-R-I. <laughs> and yeah. And then for my podcast, my podcast is called Count to 10 and it will be on all major uh, streaming platforms starting, hopefully, fingers crossed, this June. We're doing a nice little rollout for it. So keep an eye out. I'm very, very excited about it. And you will be seeing your very own, the one, the only, Eliza <laughs> Kelly. I mean, can you, guys, can you guys believe this, lady? This is unbelievable. <laughs> you are incredible. You are so magical. It is such a pleasure to be connected. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for being on the show. I cannot wait for all of, I, you're going to take over the world, low key. Oh, low key, everybody. You heard that. You heard it here first. <laughs> it was low key. It was low key. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, writing, writing some things down in my journal after this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Brie. Thank you so much. Love you. Thank you for having me.